Like you, I'm excited to hear for a firsthand account about the merger between United and Continental, which created the world's largest airline and one of Chicago's biggest private employers. And who better to tell that tale than Jeff Smizek, who was President, Chief Executive Officer, and a member of the Board of Directors of United Continental Holdings. This means he leads an organization uh, that, with its regional partners, operates 5,700 flights a day at 372 airports on six continents. Before taking his role in October 2010, Jeff was Chairman, President, and CEO of Continental Airlines. He joined Continental in 1995 as a Senior Vice President and General Counsel. Nine years later, Jeff became president and was elected to the board of directors. In 2008, he took on the additional responsibilities of chief operating officer and then became chairman in 2010. That also marked the time when he was named Aviation Week Magazine's Person of the Year. Jeff's educational background includes graduating summa cum laude from Princeton University with a, with a degree in economics, as well as receiving his JD degree from Harvard Law School. In addition, Jeff is known for being a longtime supporter of many charitable and civic organizations. He serves on the boards of the Baker Institute of Public Affairs at Rice University, the Museum of Science and Industry, and National Oil Well Varco, an oil services firm based in Houston. So please join me in welcoming Jeff Smizek to the Cranes City Club Public Affairs Forum. Jeff. Thanks, appreciate it. <clears throat> Good morning, and uh, thanks for inviting me out here this morning. I'm being blinded by this thing, so I'll uh, stand over here. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the company that we've built. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our recent systems conversion, which probably affected everybody in the room. Um, and I'll talk about whatever else happens, thank you very much, comes to mind. Um, and what I really want to do is answer your questions, because you're all uh, you're all customers, and if you're not customers, you need to get out more. Um, <laughs> and, and I really want to hear from you and hear what's on your mind. Um, you know, when we, when we decided to merge, um, and we were, I was from the Continental side in Houston, uh, looking at what network Continental had. Continental was a great carrier. I had won many awards for excellent customer service, had a, 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 a very modern and fuel-efficient fleet. Uh, continue to invest in that. Uh, but Continental was too small, and in a network business, what you need is a network, <clears throat> and you'd like to have the world's largest network. Continental was strong in New York and was strong in Latin America, but was very weak on the West Coast, was a modest player in the Pacific, but quite strong across the Atlantic. Then you take a look at what United was. United had a wonderful hub in Chicago, for the, for the traffic flows east-west for Chicago, had very strong presence on the west coast, and had a magnificent Asian network, but was very weak in Latin America, and had essentially no New York presence. Well, you put that together, and we became number one or number two in every geography of the world. And by the way, we will be flying to Antarctica. We just need to find anybody who wants to go there, and that'll make the last <laughs> continent. Um, so, you, you put those carriers together in a network business, it's good to have the very best network. So the, so the merger made an enormous amount of sense. And we tried once, as you probably can recollect, and we got very close to merging back in 2008. But at the time, 2008, you'll all remember the bad days of 2008. And the, 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 the reward, the strategy, the end game was always there, but the risk profile of the time made it just far too risky to try to execute in the middle of or at the beginning of what turned out to be a massive recession. Um, so when, uh, when I was sitting in my office in Houston, uh, sort of watching the news go across the ticker on my, on, my, on my computer screen, and I saw that United was in talk with, talk with U.S. Airways, I picked up the phone and I, uh, I called Glenn, and I said, we ought to talk again, and we did. And what had made a lot of sense back in 2008 made just as much sense, and uh, in fact, more sense again, because the the environment was more stable. So we're very pleased with what we've done. I'll tell you, merging two airlines is a huge amount of work and it takes a lot of time. Because you're merging not only massive differences in facilities and fleets and systems 
and culture um, and, 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 and facilities. And, and everything imaginable is different. And it takes a lot of time. It's not like merging two, two companies that are, the sort of, that are normal companies. But consolidation has been very good to this business. And there's a, there's a number of things that have been changing in the business that have improved the business dynamics. Because we have been, historically, as airlines, expert destroyers of capital. There, I don't think there's anybody better than we have been historically of burning other people's money. And that had to stop. Um, and consolidation was a key component. There were way too many business plans chasing way too few customers. And that doesn't work. Moreover, we have also learned as a business with high fuel prices. And high fuel prices have actually been good for the industry in many ways. Because high fuel prices have forced discipline on what was otherwise a thoroughly undisciplined industry. What we had done before with high fuel prices is we had tried to raise prices to catch up to fuel, but we weren't taking capacity out. So our load factors were dropping because of higher prices. And the seats, and in my business, every time an airplane rotates and takes off, the inventory is permanently gone. In many of your own businesses, <clears throat> you know, if you're selling shoes, if you don't know those shoes today, you can sell them tomorrow. The shoes don't evaporate every morning. My, my, my shoes evaporate every time the airplane takes off. And so you want to fill the seat. So we were diluting ourselves. And by diluting ourselves, charging less for every ticket than it costs us to provide it, we thought, we'll just make that up on volume. That doesn't work. Uh, you have to actually charge a radical concept. You have to charge more for your product than it costs you to deliver it if you're going to stay in business. And not only do you have to do that, you actually have to exceed your cost of capital. And my business is a business that has not exceeded its cost of capital, but it's doing so today. And that's a huge revolution. So capacity discipline and consolidation have been really good for the business, as has professional management. Because many years ago, the airline business was run by people who were very market share driven, sort of larger than life figures, and um, were much more concerned about market share and size than they were about profitability. But you have to be profitable. You owe it to your employees to be profitable. You owe it to the communities you serve. Chicago is not well off with carriers that are in and out of bankruptcy, that are cycling in and out, that are making plans and then, and then, and then shelving the plans. You have to have a stable business. I mean, airlines are so important. Airlines are so important to the economy. If you think of the, of the, the people and the ideas and the cargo and the trade that airlines deliver, Think of Chicago without a hub. Where would Chicago be? Would not be the great city it is today. So you want airlines to be profitable. And that's what we're very focused on doing at the New United, not only from the network, but our investments. Now, we recently did a number of things all at once. We went to a single passenger service system. We were giving very poor customer service before our system's conversion because of a, a continental person would go to a United agent. The United agent couldn't even see the person on the screen, couldn't help them. Or a United person go to a continental agent, they couldn't help them. People thought we were one airline. We were, we'd merged, but we hadn't merged systems. So we went to a single passenger service system. We went to a single loyalty program. Oh, that's not enough, we really changed the loyalty program while we're at it. We went to a single website, we changed policies and procedures at the airport, and we did it all at once. We decided to have one open heart surgery, not five, and the conversion was not perfect. Any of you who have gone through massive systems conversions know that perfection is too high a standard. And there were things that we didn't do right. There's no question about it. But let's not lose sight of what we did do. When we converted on the night of March 2nd, if we hadn't done that successfully, those airplanes would not have taken off the next day. Worldwide, they would have been on the ground. Since our systems conversion, we have flown safely over 18 million people. Now, we did have uh, systems issues, no question about it. We found them as quickly as we could. You helped us find them, I will tell you. <laughs> um, we remediated them as quickly as we could. There are still some, some issues, particularly um, issues that we knew about going in, gaps between what one system could do and what system uh, could do, and filling those gaps, which we have projects to do that. Well, we also drove a lot of heavy call volume. We drove a lot of heavy call volumes, not only for the systems glitches, because we had changed the Mileage Plus program. And there were a lot of questions, and people called. And our call volume went way up, and our average handle time went way up. And you can imagine being a customer with a, hot, with a long wait time. You're waiting a long time. By, you, by the time you get to that customer service agent, you're not a happy camper. 
And so you, the customer service agents had to spend a certain amount of time just sort of, you know, getting the customer's temperature calmed down, which of course increases the handle time, which increases the wait time, which leads to unhappy customers, right? But as we fixed the, as we as, as we have both fixed the underlying glitches and as customers have become more informed of the changes that we did to Mileage Plus, the call volumes have dropped significantly, the average handle times have dropped significantly, and we're taking good care of our customers, although we still have wait times on our Mileage Plus line that are too long. We understand that, and we're, and we're, we're working to bring those down. We're adding resources, um, and, and things are, things are, are, are clearly uh, getting, uh, getting better and better. But these systems conversions are tough, but you have to do them. You have to be one airline. And the other thing that we have gotten from the systems conversion, both the website and the loyalty and everything else, we have found things that neither carrier was doing well with respect to customer service. And I firmly believe that we will come out the other side of the systems conversion delivering far better customer service than either carrier did before. And I'm a big believer in investing in the business. And this business has been underinvested in for too long. And we are, we are many things in New United. We are, we are a technology company with wings. And technology is our future because we're a very high cost business. We're a huge business. We're all around the globe. And technology, investing in technology to improve the customer experience, to give the customer more control, to give the customer uh, uh, more information is better for the customer and better for us. It's more efficient for us, better for the customer. So you'll see us continue to make investments in technology. The payroll system at the old United was implemented when I was in high school. I'm 57 years old. So we are dragging this carrier, somewhat kicking and screaming, into the 21st century because we need to do that. We need to invest in technology. We also need to invest in our product. And we're doing that. We've announced half a billion dollar investment in our current fleet. We're putting in flatbed seats on all of our international airplanes. We'll have more flatbed seats than any other US carrier. We're putting satellite-based Wi-Fi on our entire mainline fleet big, fat broadband pipe from satellites into our entire broadband fleet, I mean, our mainline fleet. What does that mean for you? You can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> um, and there may be some issues with that. I mean, sitting next to someone who's on Skype arguing with his girlfriend, that would probably not be good on a flight to Mumbai. So we'll have to deal with those issues, I'm sure. Um, we're also buying brand new airplanes. Um, we're buying brand new airplanes from a proud Chicago company, Boeing. We have 737-900ERs. There must be a Boeing table here. Uh, if so, we'll keep talking price. Um, and we're, importantly, we're taking the new 787. Um, and and that, uh, that airplane is going to be a truly spectacular airplane. And I mean that. Most airplanes are just derivatives of old technology. The 787 is a quantum leap in technology. From a customer, from, it's a great customer-pleasing aircraft. It, it has, it's, it's a beautiful aircraft. It has a great creature comforts within it. It has, it's pressurized to a lower um, altitude because the hull itself is stronger, which means that you'll have more blood oxygen, not blood alcohol, more blood oxygen, um, which means you'll feel better. And, and we can humidify that airplane. You know how dry airplanes are because, because, the, because they're metal. Well, with, 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 with carbon fiber, which does not rust, you can humidify. The windows are huge. They're electrochromatic, which means no shades, and you push a button up and dark. And if you've ever been on a really long haul mission, long haul flight, and it's time for bed, and there's always that one customer who will not put the shade down, <laughs> the flight attendants will be able to override that customer and make the airplane nighty night time, right? And with the, and with, oh, they like that, I, it's, I like that too. Um, and, with, and, with, and with the great LED lighting, great wake-up lighting, it's, it's really a magnificent airplane from the customer's perspective. And from our perspective, not only does it deliver tremendous customer service and great product, but it's 20%, 20% more fuel efficient than the airplane it replaces. And at United Airlines, we burn more than one day's production of oil in the world every year. Think of all the oil produced in the world. In a day, in one day, we burn more than that in one year at United. 100 million barrels of jet fuel. So increases in fuel efficiency drive tremendous value, not only for us, but for the environment. 
So you'll see us continue to invest in our product. You'll see us continue to invest in our people. Valuable assets are people. Great skills, great experience. You'll see us continue to invest in our technology. A lot is going into technology. You'll see us continue to invest in our facilities here in Chicago. And for those of you who have suffered through not having jet bridges for the United Express fleet here, we're putting in jet bridges because I'll tell you, schlepping through the snow or the rain is not a good customer service. And we're going to put in jet bridges for Chicago. And we'll continue to invest in our facilities. And we'll continue to invest in, in all aspects of our business because this is a business that needs investment and has been underinvested. And that's another reason we need to be profitable. We need to have the cash flow and the profitability to continue to invest in what is a very capital intensive business. The last thing I want to talk about is the cultural change going on at the company. These two companies have had in the, in the past very different cultures. And to me, in a service business, the culture of your company is very important. Now, you have to have a, a business strategy everybody understands. We have a simple business strategy. It's one page. It's called a go forward plan. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows where we're going. And you have to have the vision for your coworkers in terms of of, of, of where you want to go and what you want to become, which in our case is the world's leading airline. We happen to be the world's largest airline. I don't really care about that. I want to be the world's leading airline. But the way you get there is with your people. And your people have got to want to give good customer service. You've got to invest in them to, to give them the tools they need to do that. But what your, what, your, what your coworkers need to do is to be listened to because they know more about the airline business than I will ever know sitting in some office building, which is why I don't tend to sit in an office building. I tend to get out and around. On Monday, I'm going to be, have given my 50th, that's right, 50, 50th CEO exchange, where I talk for a few minutes, and then I open up the floor to, to, to my coworkers. They can ask me any question they want, and I'll give them a direct and straight and honest answer. Sometimes it's the answer they don't want to hear. But I'll be direct with them. And if I don't know, I'll say, what I, I'll say I don't know. But we'll, I'll, I'll sort out. We'll figure out. We'll get an answer back to you. But you need to treat each other like you want to be treated, like your mommy taught you. And it's very, very important to listen to people, to be valued to people, and to, to be part of an organization where you feel valued, you feel listened to, because you are listened to, and where you treat each other with what we call dignity and respect, just what you, how you want to be treated in your everyday life, and communicate constantly, not only with each other, but with customers, directly and openly and honestly. And if you don't know something, don't make it up. Just say, I don't know. Because there's a tendency in people to want to say, to, you know, to want to give an answer, so they make something up, and that, that, that's just the wrong way to do it. So we have a lot of communications with our coworkers, a lot of communications with our customers, and our communications with our customers have not been perfect. That's another thing out of our conversion that, that we've discovered is we have had some communications with customers which were clearly not clear enough, and we're going to fix that. There's a lot of good things we're fixing. So I hope that you've seen, because I believe, over the course of the year, improvement in, in the new United Airlines. And I think a year from now, you'll see even more improvement. We're making progress on every front. We're making progress bringing our work groups together. That takes time. We're making progress rationalizing our fleet. That takes time. We're making progress improving our facilities. That takes time. We're making progress on our technology. That takes time. But every year, you'll see more and more improvement as we continue to focus on what matters the most, which is great customer service, a great and fuel efficient and modern product that you enjoy flying, a network that's unparalleled. I mean, we fly pretty much everywhere in the world at United Airlines. And if we don't fly, there, we're a founding member of Star Alliance, the largest airline alliance in the world. And if we don't fly you there, and if Star Alliance can't take you there, you don't want to go there. <laughs> because Star Alliance flies to places that I can't even pronounce. But we have, I think, a very bright future for the city of Chicago. For us at the New United, we've got a tremendous workforce, very experienced, very skilled, and we'll be investing in them just like we're investing in every other valuable asset in the business. And I will tell you, I am very pleased to be a resident of Chicago. Don't much like the taxes, but that's how life is. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. It's a, it's, a, it's a delightful city. It's been a very welcoming city. And we, we are very proud at United to be Chicago's hometown airline. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take some questions.
Thank you, Jeff, again for those great remarks. I'm sure you have many questions. One final reminder, if you do have some last minute questions, write them on a card and someone will be around to collect them. Now I'm happy to introduce Jim Kirk, who's Crane's Chief of Editorial Operations, who will lead the Q&A session with Jeff. Since he took this post last year, Jim has been overseeing Crane's growing number of content-based businesses in print, online, and through events like this one. Jim? I get the fun part. Put Jeff on the spot here a little bit. Uh, first question, uh, uh, got a couple of these. Uh, seems to be a very localized, uh, uh, kind of an important question. Do you ever see a third Chicago airport Piatone getting built? No. Okay. <laughs> Why not? There's, look, there's, you, there's no demand for it. Um, you know, the, the Chicago airport, the O'Hare airport is a magnificent facility uh, with plenty of room for growth. Uh, and when you start diluting a hub, you damage the city. And um, whatever purported benefits of a new airport would bring would be vastly overshadowed by the damage that would happen to the hub itself. And, you, in, and in the city of Chicago, uh, the hub is, is, uh, is clearly vital. A question about that hub. Um, <clears throat> Mayor Emanuel wants to start negotiations on the completion of O'Hara's expansion ahead of the scheduled 2013 start date. Is there anything to talk about yet? I look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> Which part are you looking forward to? Well, at breakfast meetings, we get free coffee and danishes. <laughs> no, look, I, look let, me, let, me say, let me say a couple things. Um, the, uh, first of all, um, uh, Mayor Emanuel and I and, and, my, and my colleagues at United Airlines enjoy a very good relationship. I think he's a terrific mayor. I'm happy to say that. I think he really is, and I think he's doing a superb job. Um, our position with respect to the airport is we are always interested in investing in airports where the demand justifies the investment. And that's, that's the, the, the essence of our conversation. Um, we are committed to Chicago. We're Chicago's hometown airline. Uh, we hope that the demand will be such that we can grow Chicago. Uh, and we certainly have the ability to grow Chicago if the demand is there. And one of the things that we've built in this airline is a magnificent fleet but one in which we have a lot of flexibility. That is, we have a lot of flexibility to grow the fleet if we, if we want to or if the demand is there. I mean, we clearly want to, but you have to, we don't create demand. We, we chase demand. Uh, we respond to demand. But we also have the ability to shrink the fleet in case there's a recession and demand declines. So we have a lot of fleet flexibility, but, but it's really a function of what the demand will be. You need to be out ahead of the demand. I mean, it's clearly you, you can't you know, wait for the demand is overwhelming and then, oh my goodness, there's not enough space. But one of the things that is actually far more important than pouring concrete at O'Hare is modernizing the air traffic control system in the United States. Because there is technology today that will greatly and very, very safely increase throughput without investing in concrete and save tremendous amounts for the, for, for, the, for the carriers, for the consumer, for the environment, and less fuel burn, because we have very inefficient routings. We, we, you know, we use the very finest, it's safe today, what we have today is safe, but it uses the very finest 1950s ground-based radar technology. And what we need to do is to convert to RNAV and RMP procedures, the procedures that, that, that basically have, have very defined, GPS-defined approaches, continuous descents, um, uh, smooth descents, uh, miles in trail, uh, decrease, well, you can have 40 miles in trail between airplanes. Things that can put throughput through, which means you can enhance the productivity of the assets you have already and benefit the environment and benefit the consumer and benefit the carriers. That's where our nation should be focusing, not pouring concrete. Uh, speaking of our mayor, uh, we had your counterpart from American in a few uh, weeks ago to talk about the bankruptcy process. And we asked I'm question. really glad I'm not here to talk about that. <laughs> we, we, we asked him a question about how, how uh, soon he heard from the mayor after the bankruptcy was announced, and he said it was his first call that he got. How often do you talk to the mayor? 
Um, I talk to the mayor uh, frequently, actually. Um, uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't keep track on my calendar of, of, of the days of, of the week. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's a very active and engaged person. And I will also tell you that Mayor Emanuel understands the value of air transportation to this city. And that is not the case of some mayors of some cities in this country. Um, and he understands the power that we bring to the city and how we drive huge portions of the economy. Uh, and that's a very good thing. Any uh, prediction of uh, when or how American will come out of bankruptcy and how does that affect United? Uh, you know, it, it, those things are very hard to predict, and, and, uh, and I, one thing I'm blessed by, I'm not an expert in bankruptcy. Um, I've been in the business 17 years, and at no point have I gone through a bankruptcy. Um, now, uh, the carrier I used to work for, Continental Airlines, had gone through two bankruptcies. I was lucky enough that those were before I arrived. Um, so I, I, I'm not an expert in bankruptcy. I know that they publicly stated they'd like to be out by the end of the year. I don't know whether they'll do that. I think that one thing in bankruptcy is you tend to lose a lot of control, uh, including control over your destiny. Uh, so hard to know. In terms of, in terms of, of uh, Americans' bankruptcy, you know, one never wants uh, uh, that to happen to anybody. And uh, American is a fine airline run by people of high integrity uh, with an excellent workforce. Um, they, have a, they have an issue that they're too small. Um, and who would ever think? that anybody would stand on a stage and say American's too small, but it's a fact uh, because of the consolidation that's occurred in the industry. Uh, I think that they have, they have a business plan uh, when they come out that has been subject to some degree of scrutiny and some degree of criticism, and I'm not one to scrutinize or criticize their business plan. That's up to them, that's what they do. Uh, American is a fine competitor. Uh, we've competed against American for many years and we'll be able to continue to do so. A couple of uh, culture questions, which I know you addressed during your speech a little bit. Um, this one comes uh, uh, from someone who says that he was on a United flight last week. The crew introdu introduced themselves as Continental alumni and seemed to uh, hint at their distaste for the merger. Uh, how, how are you working to uh, sort of uh, avoid the, con you know, the, the, the divide that obviously exists in a, in a, a merger situation like this? Sure. Look, look. Um Everybody will have different opinions about whether or not, among the workforce, whether we should merge or not merge. And what I find is when I'm, a, and I, 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 look, I'm not the normal CEO. I'm kind of a dirt on the fingernails operator. So on flights, I get up on the flight deck before the airplane takes off. I do that before it takes off. Because if you go in flight, they lock the door and they won't let me out. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I talk to the pilots before we take off, and then I, uh, then I work the galleys and visit with the flight attendants, and I visit with customers. And um, uh, what I found is, as I've gone across the system and talked to, talk to employees, you know, a lot of employees say to me, you know, well, everything's going United's way. And then, and then that's a continental person. And someone from, from United say, well, everything's going continental's way, which means we're probably doing it about right, because this was a merger of equals, and we're trying to pick up the best of both. Um, you know, I think that every, each company has a proud history and a proud tradition. Uh, both companies uh, had a proud past. Uh, all the employees um, are, 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 I think, respectful of the past, but I think most of, our, most of our coworkers are looking for the future. And they're looking for the future. They understand what we're building, what an opportunity. I mean, no carrier in the history of aviation has ever had this set of assets, this set of global assets, this fleet, these facilities, where we fly, the network, I mean, it's spectacular what we have. And I think most of our coworkers are, are, are excited about it, but you're always gonna have some folks who are unhappy about it, and I understand that. Change is difficult. Change is hard. But the fact is, we have merged, and we're going forward. A uh, couple of questions on um, customer service. Uh, this, this is a very uh, interesting one, given <clears throat> the speed of uh, social media and how messages can get uh, uh, pass sure. around at lightning speed. Uh, what is your strategy for dealing with the speed of customer complaints via social media? Well, look, I think, it's, I think social media is actually good. Because I'm a big believer that information is friendly and data is friendly. I mean, information and data do indeed set you free. And because you can make much better business decisions, you can be more responsive. Now, with the advent and growth of social media, media there is an expectation of immediacy as well. And that is sometimes quite difficult uh, to manage because recognize we fly the equivalent of half of the population of the United States of America every year. 
So it's a lot of people. And being as responsive as the social media drives people to expect to speak is, is, a, is a difficult task. That's not to say that we can't drive towards that. We, 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 we should. But I believe that by investing in technology so that, for example, if, if somebody buys an Economy Plus seat, for example, we're putting in Economy Plus seats, which is a magnificent product from United that, 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 that the combined carrier is adopting on its entire fleet on the, on the mainline side. Um, by, someone buys an Economy Plus seat and we have an aircraft swap, say, and right now some Continental airplanes don't have Economy Plus seats yet and they don't get it, we ought to have an auto refund feature that refunds it immediately, as opposed to the customer having to want, ask for a refund. That makes no sense. We need to do that. Well, we need the technology to do that. So as we invest in that technology, which makes us far more responsive to customers, one, it drives down complaints, and secondly, it frees up resources to deal with the expectation of immediacy of, of social media. Houston uh, was stung by the loss of of Continental's uh, corporate headquarters. Can you talk a little bit about how Chicago provides the competitive advantage from a headquarters standpoint? Well, um, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that Chicago provides a competitive advantage from the headquarters standpoint. Um, we, uh, as part of the merger, uh, we uh, negotiated various aspects of the merger, including, uh, including moving the headquarters to Chicago. Um, I think from a, from a regulatory perspective and tax perspective, uh, Chicago uh, has its work cut out for it to be competitive. There's no question about it. But I think that um, the, the Mayor Emanuel, uh, I feel like I have a stump speech for him. Um, uh, but I think Mayor Emanuel is focused on the right things here. And I think that uh, hopefully people who are reforming the legislature in Springfield are focused on the right things to make Chicago, to make Illinois more competitive. Because it's not competitive today, I will tell you, it simply isn't. Um, but it can become more competitive. It's a spectacular city. I mean, I love living here. Uh, but, but there's a lot of work to be done to make Chicago competitive to attract and retain major corporations. Now, we have a massive hub here. We have a lot of employees here. Uh, we're here to stay. I mean, this is very important for us to be here, and, we, and I think that we are good corporate citizens, not only of Chicago, but of every uh, city in which we operate. We, we believe in, in, in giving back to the community because the community gives so much to us. Uh, but I, I'd say that Chicago still has a lot of work to, to, to get itself more competitive because it's a competitive world out there. I should know I'm in the airline business. It's the most brutally competitive business in the world. Um, and uh, and you, need to, you need to be very thoughtful, uh, we do, as citizens of Chicago, and we do as, as citizens of Illinois, to make uh, both the city and the state more competitive. What, what do you think is the number one issue? Is it pension situation? Is it taxes? Well, it's, it's, it's no different here, I think. I don't want to get too much into politics. It's not my, my strong suit. But, you know, the, we have the same issues here as many municipalities and many states around making promises made to people that can't be fulfilled and will never be fulfilled and should not have been made. And now we have to deal with it as citizenry. And you can't continue to tax to fund promises that can't be fulfilled because that will just drive people out of the state. And it is a competitive world. I wonder if Springfield is listening. Um, question for your uh, Boeing friends. When will uh, customers be traveling on the uh, Dreamliner on a consistent basis? Well, we expect, look, we ordered the, the, the Dreamliner in December of 2004. In fact, <clears throat> uh, Alan Mulally, who now runs Ford, is a friend of mine, and he was speaking out at Northwestern last night at the Patterson uh, lecture, and I went to see him. And uh, when I saw him, I, I complained to him yet again he hadn't delivered my airplane yet. Um, uh, he offered me like a whole bunch of cars in return. I said, no, that wasn't good enough. Um, we ordered that airplane uh, on the Continental side in December of 2004. We're going to get the first airplane in September of 2012. So we've been patient. Um, it, but the wait will have been worth it. Uh, we expect to get five of them this year. We have, a, we have a firm order for 50. We have options for many more. We also have ordered the Airbus A350, uh, which, is, which is not produced yet, um, which, uh, which, will all, which, will, which is also a spectacular product. So we're going to have a, a, a large fleet of very fuel efficient, very customer pleasing wide body aircraft coming down the pike over the next few years. And we're very excited uh, to take the airplane. As I said earlier, it's a, it really is a spectacular airplane. It's a good question about uh, what kind of growth or uh, distress are you seeing either from uh, the problems in Europe uh, or some of the uh, 
uh, emerging uh, countries in Asia uh, in terms of um, revenue and traffic? Are you, are you seeing a mixed bag there? Uh, the yes, market? you know, we have, we have actually uh, very good uh, insight into the global economy because we serve the global economy and we have boots on the ground everywhere and we have, we have uh, amazingly sophisticated and complex data systems where that we can analyze and see the data in real time. Um, and I'll tell you, as a sort of, as, as sort of generality, um, the United States uh, is roughly skating sideways. Uh, there are some indications of some hyper-modest recovery from our perspective, but pretty much skating sideways. Uh, the European economy is in the toilet. There's no question about it. Um, uh, Asia is still uh, good, but is itself uh, slowing a bit. And also, we at United um, are very uh, big in China. And uh, China has been a very attractive market. And very attractive markets tend to attract more capacity which tends to have a degradation of yields, so we see that in China. But still a very attractive market, and Asia is a very attractive market. Um, and the, the, the booming market right now is Latin America. Uh, our Latin American business is, is just screaming right now. Uh, but the great thing about having the network and the diversity in the portfolio that we have is we do have a portfolio of assets, so if Europe's doing poorly, Latin America helps to offset it. Or if Asia slows and the United States can grow, I mean, we have a portfolio. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what you read about in the papers is pretty much what we see in, in demand. This uh, question just came in and maybe the most important one. Cubs or Sox? <laughs> <laughs> you know, being new to the city, I have to say I love them both. You sure you're not in politics? I mean, that's pretty good. <laughs> Another good one. Do you ever fly uh, Economy or Economy Plus? You betcha all the time. Um, and I also fly our competitors whenever I can, because that's how you learn. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and many of my colleagues are here, and they know that the moment I land, they get a series of emails about, why are we doing this? Why are they doing that? Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Uh, they're, they're, they're laughing here. Yes, it, it's true. Um, yes, and I only fly commercial, because it's very important uh, that, uh, one, I, we experience our own product. And I fly coach all the time. I, 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 I will tell you, I prefer up front. <laughs> you should too. <laughs> it's better up there. But, but I need to experience the product. And I, I particularly, I mean, I, I, I love flying. I fly a lot uh, uh, at United, obviously. I love talking to our crew, and I like visiting with customers. And I will tell you, one thing that I do, m most all, in fact, I think all CEOs in the airline industry hide from their customers. I don't do that. If you put 10 airline CEOs against the wall, I bet you could only pick out me. And that's not an ego trip. It's really something that I think is very wise. It comes at some personal cost to me, I will assure you. Um, but, but that way, you'll learn. Because people recognize you, walk up to you, and tell you what's going on. And the other thing I do is because I'm a dirt under the fingernails operator, I know thousands of my own employees. So no one of my direct reports or any of my officers can, can BS me. Because I can pick up the phone and call someone on the ramp if I want to to find out what's going on. And that's really helpful because, you know, it's, CEOs can sometimes live in a bubble. And you can't run a business in a bubble and you can't be effective in a bubble. So I love to fly, not only ourselves, but I love to fly competitors because you learn a lot. I mean, I, I, and, and it's interesting, at, at Alan Mulally's talk, uh, yesterday, he was mentioning that when he first got to Ford, he drove in, and none of the cars in the parking lot for the executives was a Ford, right? It was a good indication that something was wrong at Ford, <laughs> right? And today, what they do is they, he, Alan drives a different Ford product every day, rotates through them, and drives competitors' products as well, and they bring in competitors' products. Well, that's what you need to do. That's how you run a business. Would you like to rate your competitors? I'm right sorry? Now? Would you like to rate your competitors right now? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, we all hate flying in the small commuter planes. Can you please phase them out in larger cities? You know, Request. that's an interesting, it's an interesting point. Let me, let me talk about, about the role of regional carriers. Because everybody would rather be in a mainline plane than a regional plane. There's no question about it. But if we didn't have regional planes, we also wouldn't be flying to the breadth of the network we have because those, those regional carriers provide us the feed that we need to fly nonstop to China, nonstop to Narita, nonstop from New York to New Delhi to Mumbai, 
uh, Shanghai, Beijing, uh, you know, the new service we just announced to Buenos Aires uh, from New York, um, all that feed. And if you take away that, we would be a much smaller carrier with many fewer employees and much less impact on the city of Chicago and much less value to you. Now, what we do is we have now a good product in 70-seat regional jets, which have a, 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 you know, a bigger hull, uh, have a first-class section. Um, but, but I understand that regional jets are not attractive product as a mainline. But for, for markets that, can't, that don't have the demand for a mainline that we want to serve and we should serve, we do. And, and if you're talking to business customers, Sometimes, I mean, th this isn't really a real trade-off because you wouldn't do it, but you say, you know, would you like to have four times a day service on an RJ or once a day service on a mainline? Most people would prefer the frequency because if the meeting is over early, they want to go. They don't want to hang out for the rest of the day to get the one mainline flight. So regional jets, regional products are here to stay. The, the proper mix is really determined by the network and the demand and the flow. Um, but we want to make sure that the regional product is as attractive and clean and safe and reliable as the mainline product. Um, and uh, and we're, we're, we continue to work on that. Uh, we believe that um, and we'll continue to invest in the regional fleet. And I think the two class, regional fleet, the, the first class in, in 70 seaters is actually a really good product. It's something actually that Continental didn't have because we had a scope clause and still do at, the, at Continental until we get a joint collective bargaining agreement that wouldn't even permit us to fly aircraft larger than 50 seats without putting a mainline pilot in command, which of course destroys the economics. So um, uh, uh, with, with, with the merger, now we have a pretty big fleet of, of I think, quite attractive 70 seat uh, regional jets. Uh, but, but you'll always have regional jets, otherwise you'd have tiny uh, mainline airlines, which none of you would like. You talked a little bit about in your speech, yeah, you, can you just sort of characterize your relationship with the unions right now? A well, I, I, think, I, I think they're good. I think we're making very good progress. Uh, I mean, if you think about the work groups, you know, bringing work groups together in the airline business is a long process. First of all, we had, we're a very highly unionized business. And we had work groups represented by different unions. Well, the, only the coworkers can select their union at whatever time, pace, period they want to do that. We can't affect that. We're in, in management. We had, we had coworkers who, who want to know whether or not they wanted to have a union. And they had to vote on that. All of that has now shaken out. And so from on the ramp, we have a single union. We're in joint negotiations on the ramp. For our agents, our customer contact agents and the agents at the airport, at Continental, they were not represented. At United, they were. They had an election. They chose a union. We're now beginning the joint negotiations there. For our tech ops folks, the, ma the maintenance folks, folks who maintain the airlines, the, the airplanes, we have, a, we have a, a contract on the Continental side. We have a contract on the United side. We're in joint negotiations. For the flight attendants, we have a contract on the United side that we recently reached and was ratified, a contract on the continental side. We're in joint negotiations. And with the pilots, we're in joint negotiations. But negotiations take time. They're very complex. But what's important is our commitment to reaching agreements as promptly as we can that are competitive. We have to be competitive. We have to pay our coworkers competitively. It's our job to do that. It's also our job not to pay them more than competitively, because that destroys the future of the airline and, 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 and makes jobs insecure. So we will reach agreements that are fair to the company and fair to the coworkers. And we're very focused on it. We have the negotiations are ongoing literally as we speak with all of these work groups. And I think we're making very good progress. A couple more questions. Uh, yesterday, United announced that it was going to match Delta in terms of a fare increase. It's a fifth attempted fare increase this year. Do you see this? finally sticking at this point? You have uh, my lawyers prices. spank me if I talk about uh, uh, future prices, so I can't answer that. But they're not here, are they? Can <laughs> <laughs> I can run, but I cannot hide from them. <laughs> United has said it would, uh, will consider reducing capacity by 10% in Houston if the city allows Southwest to start flying international routes from uh, Hobby. Uh, if that happens, will any of that flying be moved to Chicago? Um, look, the, this, this, this question is actually related to the Piatone question. I mean, in, in Houston, um, Houston's always had a, a, an international hub uh, at IH, Intercontinental, and a domestic hub um, at Hobby. And um, the Houston City Council is considering having international service uh, out of Hobby, uh, thinking that, that will be beneficial to the city. Um, but the, whatever benefit is derived from that will be vastly overshadowed by its adverse impact on the hub 
the Inter and not just United, but BA and Lufthansa and all the other carriers that serve the hub. And uh, it's not that we're considering pulling down the hub. We will pull down the hub. We have to. We have no choice. And what will happen is, as, because Houston is about 70% flow traffic, just like I was talking about the, the regional airplanes that provide the feed, well, that flow traffic fills up the airplanes. So let's take a city like Houston, Auckland, okay, which we've announced on the 787. How many local Kiwis do you think there are flying between Houston and Auckland on any day? I don't know, two? I don't know, not many, right? It's all flow traffic. Well, you start taking away that flow, and guess what happens to that route's projected profitability, right? Well, so the answer is, if this occurs, if the city should be as foolish as to do this, we absolutely will have to pull down the hub, and we will have to furlough about 1,300 people, 1,300 jobs lost. It's sad, but in answer to your question, of course we'll redeploy the assets. We have mobile assets, and that's why cities need to remain competitive, and that's why hubs need to be competitive. And that's why you can't just raise rents and landing fees and taxes on airlines. By the way, we're taxed, while I'm on the subject, <laughs> we're taxed more heavily than alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, uh, US airlines, 20% taxes before we get a dollar of our own revenue, before we pay income tax. At 20% off the top, you don't have to worry about income tax, right? How many of your businesses would function well if the government took 20% of your top line before you saw a dollar? That's what's happening in the U.S. aviation business today, which is why you see so many U.S. aviation uh, operators focusing more and more overseas where you can make money. But back to your question, of course, quick aside, um, of course we will relocate the assets, and of course Chicago will be a beneficiary. One last question, you're off the hot seat. Um, when I call United, I almost always get an offshore receptionist. Do you have any plans to... Uh, bring that uh, customer uh, uh, reservation well, system that's back a, to Well, that's US. someone who's not an elite, because all of our elites are handled, all of our premier and upper handled onshore. Um, and so we have, you know, the reality is we are a competitive business and we have to have sort of best shoring of costs and best sourcing of costs. And we want to provide the best customer service that we can. That's why we're so focused on technology. We can minimize those calls so we can get more and more functionality on the web, more and more self-service. Um, but, for, but for customers who are lower value in terms of yield, um, they uh, are steered towards lower cost in terms of customer service, and customers of higher value uh, are steered towards um, for higher levels of service uh, because they've earned it because of the value to the carrier. Um, uh, I want to be able to give great customer service, uh, uh, whatever the channel and whatever, whatever the call center is, uh, but, uh, but, but we do have to focus on cost, but more, most importantly, we have to focus on, on improving our technology, improving the information to customers, include, improving the self-service, making, making it so the customer doesn't have to take actions that we ought to have taken ourselves, and you'll see us making more and more of those investments so that we continue to deliver better and better and better customer service. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.